uh, in this session, I'm planning to cover um, the durable functions, basically some learnings, um, so to say, for working with durable functions for the last two and a half years, basically. Um, some tips, tricks, things like that um, along the line. So basically, I uh, named the slide deck as make the best out of durable functions. Predominantly, the, the slide package was actually, uh, I was done this for a, a, a sort of a training for internal uh, team. But again, um, I'll, I'll try to see if I can find a balance between all the concepts as well as some tips and tricks as well. Um, so before going forward, um, introducing myself, I'm Randy Ratnaika, uh, currently working at Telstra Purple as a lead consultant. I myself is a Microsoft certified trainer and also with a bunch of um, you know, certifications behind my back. Um, so what are we going to cover today? Uh, I'll try to find a balance basically to give some good introduction for durable functions. So along the way, I'll be giving the concepts what durable functions actually is and sort of like anyone who doesn't uh, have worked with in the past uh, or if anyone knows, um, bear with me because I'm trying to cover the balance between everyone. Um, finally, we then we moved on to try and, trying to understand what it's trying to solve and how it's solving uh, by understanding, uh, doing a deep dive into the concepts uh, behind the scenes, how they work. Uh, again, I'll try to be um, very clear about, you know, only to give you the enough to know because then you will understand why it's all about in place, all these best practices, tips and tricks we, I'm going to share is going to make sense. Um, by, all, by the end of the session, I will open up for questions, but by all means, if you have any questions as you go along, feel free to stop me and actually ask the question. Unfortunately, I can't see your hands or even faces. I'm looking at a screen and actually uh, talking, but uh, feel free to unmute yourself and actually jump and ask the question itself. Um, moving on. So intro to Azure functions or Azure durable functions. Why did I put a durable functions in within brackets? The whole concept of durable function sounds like, uh, you know, another big concept that someone may have not worked with. And it sounds like a big, heavy word. However, what I want to emphasize throughout this session is actually Azure durable function is nothing but just, again, Azure functions, but written and actually implemented in a de specific design pattern so that you don't need to think about uh, the durability of that. So uh, let's move on to understand the basic of Azure functions to start with. What is Azure Functions? <clears throat> it's essentially a response to a, a event. Um, or the, there's a whole heap of events, uh, which I'm not representing all of them here, but as you can see, there can, there can be timers, there can be HTTP triggers basically, or some Azure event grid um, you know, uh, events that is going to trigger this. All this going to basically raise an event for something to happen or take place. In a sense, what's going to happen is the actual function that we are going to build is going to be executed and carry out some business logic and actually do and perform some task. It can be written in many languages. Today, my, my favorite language is C-sharp, so I will be focusing more on C-sharp one. So bear with me if you're not familiar with C-sharp, but I'm trying to find you the best, uh, again, um, the, the common commonalities in the concepts so that you can actually forget about the actual language aspects of it because technically, uh, as part of the design, they all support each other, uh, very, very well complement each other as well. So once it executes logic, predominantly what's going to happen is it's produce some outputs, whether it's actually another event that you're going to trigger or whether you're going to actually, um, you know, store some data or maybe, um, you know, um, maybe do something with it. Basically, it's an ever-growing collection of services that uh, Azure Function supports. So Azure Function is a nutshell. It's basically response to event and execute some logic and produce some outputs. So what it's actually durable functions come into play and actually trying to solve what Azure functions cannot do or what Azure functions lacks that durable functions try to address. Essentially durable functions is an extension to your Azure functions. It's in a way, uh, it's actually um, kind of like complement uh, or addresses a core issue, I would rather say in Azure functions where it's actually meant to be short lived without any state. Azure Functions, uh, like the consumption plan in, from Microsoft, it's meant to be running for about 10 minutes. Even if you're on a premium one, uh, you've been capped at, uh, you'll be capped at about 30 minutes just to avoid you extra cost and all that. The whole durable function concept is actually a way of designing your functions in a way that you will manage the states and will run on a computer, you know, serverless environment without you needing to actually write all the state management, um, you know, exception handling, all the chaining events 
without you know implementing all you, by yourself. So underneath, it's using a durable task framework, which I'll touch base uh, in a later slide. But uh, for now, the entire concept is actually wrapped around the durable um, task framework and actually build this design pattern for you to actually build durable functions in the same way that you would be writing anything else. You don't need to specially think about how, um, you know, how to manage all that. It's taken care of for you. So what it's trying to solve. Predominantly, it's trying to solve the managing the state aspect of it. Of course, that's why the durable function comes into play. The other biggest aspect is it actually extends your lifespan of your um, you know, Azure function, so to say, by using something called checkpoints. The whole purpose of the checkpoints is as you're reaching a particular stage, basically uh, doing some activity, it will create a checkpoint and basically go to sleep until that checkpoint is completed. Once that checkpoint is completed only, it will continue on that. By doing that, basically what you do is you, rather than keep running your Azure function, it is using some sort of a, like a sleep and wake up pattern on and off. So it will extend its lifespan for a longer time, not even 30 minutes to one hour. It can be running for days, uh, again, depending how or what your business re requirement is. Finally, it simplifies the complex workflows by you know, splitting into functional components. If you design the actual, actual uh, the durable function right, technically it's very simplified way of actually, uh, it encourages reusability and it encourages you to write your functions more, um, you know, the focus to one particular thing to do. It's very focused on a smaller task and then the orchestration will take care of that, will be running in sort of like order to make sure that they will be doing the expected outcome. Uh, if I was in a pretty much in a room, I would have asked the question, you know, um, just maybe a random number. What do you think that, you know, how many Azure functions are required to create one durable function use case, for example? And this is one of the questions that I pretty much get from many uh, people who are starting with Azure functions. All of a sudden, the answer is like going to be throw everyone else off. That is number like, you know, we need three minimum Azure functions to create one durable scenario. And that itself is kind of like a question, why we had to write three functions to do one thing, where could I have done one function altogether? We're going to look into the, the aspects, a bit more detail going forward. So basically those three things are, one is starter function, the other one is called orchestrator function, the other one is called activity function. They are not anything special, but they are the concept of the, the three types of the Azure functions we re need minimum to run an end-to-end durable function altogether. They have a specific task and a scope to do and run and understanding that is very well is very important for us to actually continue into the session. So basically durable function is not a replacement for Azure function. It's a complementary for Azure function. It's actually um, doing more than Azure functions can do. It's basically uplifting your Azure functions capabilities. Um, we're going to dive into just uh, sort of like a disclaimer. So we're going to dive into a bit of a code exercises here. I'll try to be as slow as possible in the sections because I want you to sort of grasp the idea and actually maybe read the code through. I'm trying to avoid going back to the editor. So I've actually got the snippets of the code, by, but I also got the actual code that I used in the entire presentation as a separate GitHub uh, repository, which I'm happy to share at the end if you, anyone wants to deep dive themselves at the later on. Um, so let's look at starter function. So starter function is pretty much another ordinary Azure function. Uh, if you look at it in this particular example, it's actually a queue triggered um, function basically to onboard an employee pretty much. And what it does is um, it's, if you write in Azure functions like in today, it will be having some, some logic to basically to onboard that employee, maybe you know, send, send a welcome email at the end, whatever that is. We can actually write all that in one function as well. However, things get a bit complicated as soon as you have more business requirements coming in. In that case, what you cannot do is you can't use, like I said, you can't use one function for that. You have to do a long running orchestrator for that. So the starter functions responsibility is there will be an injected durable orchestration client. As you can see, um, it's on the screen. It's basically the second line that you're injecting. It will be injected for you. You don't need to worry about it. As soon as you put that durable client and the durable orchestration client into your code, your normal function become a starter function that you can do a lot more than just a function what it can do. So starter function is basically responsible to kick off the actual orchestrator. And in return, 
the, that method will return you an instance ID, which later on you can use to basically track, maybe ask for a status, or you know even raise events for that. Like you know, if you don't want to, that workflow to keep running, you can actually terminate it if you want. So things like that you can do. So start a function, like I said, it's very uh, scope only to kick off the actual orchestrate itself. So the orchestrator will be the one that actually will be performing the work, not the start of function. Start of function is just like a ignite or a trigger for the actual orchestrator. So start a function, it is responsible to create a new orchestration and it also can get statuses and maybe terminate or raise events depending on the scenario or those sort of things. Going on to the tail end of things, activity functions. We're looking at the tail end of our uh, three boxes that we looked at earlier on. So starter function was on the far left and activity functions on the far right. Activity function, again, uh, it's another, merely another function. It's just doing, um, you know, uh, what any other function would do. It's basically perform some work. The only difference in this one is it's going to actually have that same injected durable um, context, but it's specifically designed for durable activity context which will actually have some activity related things that you can do. In here, again, in the example, uh, I'm very, you know, very much shown a small example here where you can actually get the context to get the input that you passed into this activity function, and then maybe get the request ID or whatever and actually pass on to the actual service. All the activity function is meant to do is actually pass on to and do some work you know, underneath with, with whatever the business logic that requires. However, we encourage dependence injection, as you can this in example, if you use dependence injection, actually inject your services, technically activity function is merely a data transformer. Basically it receive an command with some input. We don't do any much information. We just pass on to the actual service because one thing you cannot do in the orchestration function, which we are going to touch next is actually calling the service directly. We shouldn't technically. For that reason, we have the activity function Again, activity function doesn't maintain states. It's actually just meant to be actually sitting there to do that business process or call the actual underneath service in this case. And why we are encouraging um, the dependent injection is actually to make sure that you can be unit testable your code and write the same thing that you all love and do today as without a change. That doesn't mean that uh, activity functions cannot be unit tested. This whole, if, if I did the whole presentation, I'll be covering the activity function unit testing as well. But unfortunately with the time today, it's a chopped version of my full session. So it will be not covered in this one, but again, active function can be tested, but it meant to be not running all the business logic. As we all know, let the business logic written in a domain level and it will be handled by the domain classes itself. So, Activity functions, they are responsible to perform the work. Uh, they can do simple logic, but never meant to be doing the business logic. Basically you should not be doing, you know, uh, business sort of like rules and all that, but you can actually transform the data back and forth and within the services and let the service handle that conditions and business logic, which again can be unit tested. Ideally, they should not be handling the exceptions and actually, um, you know, basically absorb that exception. They should let it bubble up all the way to the orchestrator. It is very important if activity function um, start absorbing the exceptions, the orchestrator will never get to know about uh, something went wrong. So therefore the orchestration will never show off something went wrong. Later on, I'll be going into a quick demo, which you'll be seeing that uh, the orchestrator will be even um, you know, highlighting that whether something failed or whether something ran successfully. In order for the, all that to work in mechanics, you should not be handling the exceptions. Uh, I, I might be, you know, triggering some alarm bells here, thinking, oh, you should, you are saying that we should not be handling exceptions. You can handle exceptions if you wish to, but ideally that will be most like maybe logging it and actually throwing it off to the, the again, throw it back to the orchestrate itself. Why not the orchestrate handle itself? Because one of the pre predominant problems that in our learnings, what we had was, if we try to handle the exception in all layers, what will happen is soon or later, we're going to be end up with the same error log messages repeated over and over again. So ideally the best thing is to do is let the activity function fail. If there's exception, throw it off to the actual orchestrator to handle it itself. Finally, activity function, it's like a same, same other normal Azure function. They, they do not maintain state. So the question is we covered three out of two, both of them doesn't maintain state. So who's actually maintaining the state then? It is the orchestrator function. It is the beauty of the entire durable function concept. The durable function, the entire function is again, similar to another normal Azure function, but it's 
In this case, it will be injected durable orchestration context, which can do a little bit more than the starter, a little bit more than the activity. The orchestration context that actually injected here can do a lot more than just um, you know, starting another orchestrator or you know, doing some performing or work. In the later on slides, we'll be focusing more onto the orchestration function itself, uh, little by little. But for now, the orchestration function is barely it's just another function, but it's in written in a way that you know you're injecting the durable orchestration client context for that. That client context is the powerful or creates the powerfulness to actually create the state behind the scene for you. So every time that you use that context and actually say, you know, um, call another activity or call another orchestrator, what will happen is behind the scene, the state will manage for you. You don't need to think about it. So orchestrator function, they are responsible to actually, you know, calling activities or other orchestrator functions. They're meant to be coordinating execution steps and order. And they also, you know, responsible to maintain the state. Um, they can also um, set custom statuses, which probably we'll be looking at some examples later on the slides and provide some rich information into your logging. If you're doing some logging, if you're handling some um, you know, exceptions, things like that, you can provide some uh, uh, context into those logging, saying that in which function, which instance of that function sort of like went, went in wrong, things like that can be provided for you. They should handle the exceptions. However, they should also bubble up the exceptions. The reason being, the same reason, like if you have an orchestrator, later on you decide to use that orchestrator function by another orchestrator function by calling or chaining event. If you start actually handle the exception and never bubble it up, what will happen is you will never get to see that exception. Instead, you will get, um, you know, something went nicely, everything went okay. You need to bubble that exception up. The importance of that is if you bubble it up, Again, it will of course crash in that case because something happened, something wrong happened. But in the task framework, it will marked as a durable function as failed. You will see that in the actual history tables, they are as a, a failed instance. If you handle it and actually absorb the error and actually never bubble it up, what will happen is your act, actual, uh, the function will complete without actually you know, any, any errors or failure. They also should be deterministic. What I mean by that is, if you're using, again, we'll be looking into more detailed examples for this one. Um, like if you're using random numbers or uh, getting the current UTC time, they're never going to be deterministic. Why? If in the orchestrator, at the time of executing that logic, if the time or the random number is generated and later on when it's replaced the history, the same will be not be the same as you're executing it because the date time UTC will be date time UTC the random number will be regenerated for you. You will be meant to be using activity function for this reason of that you need to maintain that state. So in order to maintain that sort of state, you need to use that context that you were injected to call other activity functions or other uh, orchestration clients, not um, you know, doing that business logic within that. They also works very well when designing uh, ID important. Basically, um, it, it is sort of an arguable question or sort of like a matter to discuss further. Uh, there were a number of discussions with, uh, within our team as well that we were discussing this. Should we design always our orchestrator function to be basically to rerun? Uh, it's a question that we probably need to put back to the design board and say whether it's actually worth implementing that way. Essentially what this means is if a orchestration uh, failed, we should be able to run that orchestration again. When we run any steps that has been already completed should automatically skipped or taken care of and you'll be run from where you actually left off. Again, it's a design decision. Uh, I cannot say that we must, but it works very well. That's why I put very carefully that word. It works well when you design um, in that manner. Um, we can go into that sort of examples later on. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer that as well. Finally, they should not be directly calling service. It is very, very, very tempting. Uh, Azure functions now support dependence injection. Uh, even in the orchestrations, you can do dependence injection. You can call uh, your normal services from the Azure durable functions as well, but you should not be using durable or the orchestrator functions to directly call your services. The reason being, every time you call your service, it will be not be state managed unless you call an activity, unless you call an, um, you know, orche another orchestrator, via that context, it will be just not deterministic. 
it will run that service again and run that logic again. You should not be doing that. Let the activity and let the other orchestrators take care of for you. So finally, the complete picture. So we have a starter function, which may actually kick off, a, which should kick off orchestrator, which can kick off other orchestrators or other activity functions. So the complete picture here is that you start from your left and basically it's one orchestrator function for sure. And the orchestrator function itself can call other orchestrators or other activity functions. Now these activity functions may run in serial or may run in parallel. Again, there are design, design choices we need to make and we need to consider carefully look into that, whether we can run them in parallel or whether we need to run them in sequence, basically based on the, your business requirement. A um, bit more dive into the orchestrator functions. Before I'm going further, uh, I would like to see if there's any questions or any, any burning things that before I go into continue. If it... uh, yeah, uh, Randy, I've got one for you. Sure. Um, what do you think about the durable HTTP calls in an orchestrator that they let you do? Uh, I haven't used it myself. Um, uh, that's something that I'm actually due to use, but uh, I've never used the durable HTTP context um, in one of those, but it, it will be uh, interesting to know something that I've not worked with, uh, William. Mm, I, I think uh, from memory, I also only just use it once. <laughs> uh, it lets you make a, a HTTP call, but it, it's still replay safe. So it, every time the, the orchestrator replays that initial call yep. uh, output is, is persisted. So they take care of that state for you. Yep. Um, but I think it is very useful, for instance, in yeah, case so we once have to we call another Azure service or something with, yeah. Once you go into the example, I think, work. yeah, I, th I think once you go into the example of um, showing the actual how the backend works altogether, I think it will make sense altogether. I think they can even improve it further on not only HTTP because they can even do for others as well. It's all about how mm -hmm. you manage your state when you actually call something out without actually needing to call activity functions. Good, good. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Um, okay, so um, orchestrator functions calling other activity functions, so which we already covered. And now I'm actually uh, highlighting only the fact, uh, the fact that we can actually call other activity function with or without return types. It's very important to understand. Again, you, when, once we go into the actual demo, you will understand why, if you are not meant to actually return anything, do not return it because it's actually managed in the background for you. If you're returning an object, if you're returning an, any information back in the activity functions, they will be written in storage. It is very, very be, much concerning. Uh, like if you're actually sharing sensitive information back and forth. Um, like we had situations like people actually have some, again, emails or even people's names and things like that. The business has been questioned when durable functions is actually passing, you know, people's full names and emails across functions. Are they are they actually, you know, any more privacy is concerned now? Because all of a sudden, your private information you are sharing um, via the functions automatically they get stored in a different storage, which is not um, something that you think of when you actually do it, but security will definitely ask you that. So one of the first calls that we actually make is. When we actually return something, we ask the question whether we do we really need something to be returned. If we need to be returned, then it should be used somewhere maybe to actually flow, change the flow of the orchestrator maybe. But then the question asks, do we need to return all that information? This is again a common mistake that we might be actually returning the entire employee detail maybe which have more sensitive information, which is going to be stored in the actual um, the task history, so to say. So the question is, there are options with no return type or with return type. Um, we are not saying not to use return types. You can use return type. If you are using, then you should be having very good reasons and they should be actually only enough information. The other important fact here is that you need to understand uh, as, as you're working with the inputs and outputs that you're passing by, it's not by passing by reference, they're passing by value, uh, which is again, uh, something that we all stumble upon because um, as pretty much functional programmers, we will be calling other methods and basically, um, you know, very easily we'll be forget about that. You know, I pass an object, do some changes within that activity function, but that unless you return that updated object, you will not, when you come back to the orchestrator back to run, that will be not the updated object. If you want that updated object, you probably need to either get it explicitly called back and get that up updated object or else you need to be returning that. So it's very important to understand it's not passing by reference, it's passing by values. Because what's happening is as an 
orchestrator function hand over that task to another activity function. Orchestra function actually triggers another function as to go to sleep. It never retains that in the memory. It actually goes to sleep. The orchestrator functions calling other orchestrator functions. Again, the first two is pretty much the same. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat that. You can call other orchestrator functions from within an orchestrator. It's the same way with or without return types. However, the important one that I would like to highlight is you can call other orchestrators in parallel, which means that you can actually call and begin another orchestrator unless you want, don't want to wait for that. You can actually kick off and fire and forget basically. You fire it, you forget, you never want to wait for that. You basically kick off another parallel workflow because it needs to be run in parallel. Uh, in this particular example, we are doing onboard, um, onboarding an employee and we, we decided the payroll onboarding can be happen in parallel. There's no dependency as far as the first few parts are done. Like, you know, if the employee's credentials and things like that are done, or if the employee's first parts of the process is done, then the later stages we can say, yep, payroll can start on its own now. So payroll process will be completely started without actually wait, needing to wait for the entire payroll to finish to complete this kind of the orchestration. It's important to understand whether you need to wait for it because you have some implications, because you have some other uh, you know, side effects by not waiting. If you don't need to wait, you can fire it and forget and continue on. Again, it's a decision that you've got to make sure that uh, you're going to make at the time of design of your workflows. Being resilient, uh, again, um, so the orchestration, of the actual functions can be resilient. Uh, I, only, I only show the activity function here, but technically you can do the same for the orchestrator functions as well. Basically what you do is you have an activity function or orchestrator, basically they might be flaky for some reason. Um, there are obvious reasons. Maybe there was underneath system, they, they may have a glitches and you know that if you try it again, it might work. Um, if that's the case, we can actually use something called, you know, call activity or orchestrator with retry async with some retry options. Again, this is something that we got to decide what is that retry interval? What is that maximum attempts based on your requirements and based on your business needs? However, there's option available. You can actually um, sort of leverage it if you have a flaky, um, you know, Azure function uh, or Azure activity or orchestrator function in that case. However, in order for this to work, my previous comment on bubbling exception becoming important. If you don't bubble the exceptions out, there will be no exception happen. Therefore, the activity will never retry again because activity is concerned. Activity was okay. It returned okay, it completes okay. So it's very important for you to bubble that exception up if you want to sort of like use these retry patterns. Fan in and fan out, one of my favorites. Um, in this particular scenario, I'm just using um, like, you know, assigning Jira licenses as an example for the code, code perspective. Uh, basically, let's say that activity functions don't depend on each other. They can go in and individually and actually perform their own task. In this case, what we're doing is we can actually put them into uh, like thread parallelism. We can actually put them into a thread and we can wait for once for all saying that, you know, we are waiting for all of them to complete. What will happen is orchestrator function will kick off all these three or more and actually go to sleep. And until the all three completes, it will not run it again. Once the all three completes, the orchestration in the behind the scene will re-wake up the actual uh, orchestrator to continue from where it left off. So again, it also depends on, um, you know, whether, whether uh, your functions are depending on each other. If not, that can be used. I can give a classic example for how something that this sort of design pattern really helped us. So we had a requirement about um, to collect about um, 24 months worth of uh, cost data from different clouds, AWS and Azure for one of the products that we did. For about thousand cloud accounts, we had to get that 24 months of data and do some number crunching and basically come up with some reports. Uh, in this particular in scenario, the, the development team actually used Azure Functions, of course, to basically crawl all that 24 months of data, financial data via CSVs and actually process that which actually took uh, surprisingly very long time because it has very large number of records when we didn't realize that it's about 20 million records for the entire that uh, 24 months worth of data. We had about 20 million line, line records. By changing the entire paradigm to durable functions and actually using the fan in, fan out, to do all the number crunching for the last 24 months and everything, the entire thing finished up less than, I think, 30 to 40 minutes, pretty much. It is that powerful if you use it right. And therefore, it's again, 
there's availability for you to fan in and fan out and for basically to expedite your uh, workflows or make them work faster. There are multiple scenarios like this, uh, especially around, uh, you know, if you have multiple blobs to sort of like handle or multiple billing files to handle things like that, you can fan out and fan in when you are done with it. Um, I think I covered this a uh, bit earlier uh, that we cannot use um, just simply daytime UTC now. Uh, the orchestrator functions, when they're calling for the current time, you, they should be using context current uh, or that, that injected context current UTC date time. The importance of here is the time of this function it's going to return is going to be the same time that it was originally executed time will be returned in this case. If you use date time now, it will be the current system time. There's no, no guarantee of that being deterministic. It will be whatever the time as you speak. So if you have to write up a function to basically say, wait for some time, or maybe, you know, have a timeout or something like that, you cannot use date time UTC or, you know, basically say, you know, get the current time and add something up and check it out. You must use the durable task whatever the time that it was first executed time so that it will become deterministic. Therefore, what will happen is if a function runs on that time, when the function was actually, you know, go past that beyond that point, when it replaces that event, as per that event, it will be automatically will be, you know, elapsed. It, therefore, it will not be running that part of the code block again. Technically, it's not running that again because it's UTC time is already whatever the time it was at the first time of its execution. Um, hello, did I lose you guys? I'm still here. I can still hear oh, you. Sorry. Um, so, okay. Go, oh, good. Um, okay. So the final one is about, uh, sleeping, uh, again, uh, putting a durable function to a sort of a sleep, uh, to wait, uh, basically to avoid, um, keep it running. Uh, in, in a scenario where you actually have, let's say a long running operation, for example, let's say you're waking, waiting for a human approval. Uh, rather than actually waiting for that function to be running, um, you know, again and again with thread sleeps and all that, basically here, there's a built-in functionality for the durable function to say, yep, we tried for this minute, there was no approval, therefore go to sleep. How frequent do you do that sleep and how frequently you wake it up? It's actually depending on your business requirement. However, ideally that once you decided that ideal times, basically you can create a timer and actually forget about it. At this moment, the orchestrator function, what will create is it will create actually a sort of a queue trigger, future into that time, basically say, wake me up in, around this time, then I'll wake it up and actually continue from where I left off. So that way, what you're doing is you're actually expanding the durable functions runtime because you're not running every time, because your functions technically finishes and go to sleep, it will not count it as executing. It's close to sleep. Once the time is elapsed, it will wake up again, replay all the events up until that moment, try to execute that business logic to see if that is completed. If not, basically, you know, um, go back to another sleep again. So finally, coming on to the understanding of um, how uh, the, the durable functions works under the cover. So we need to understand how durable functions work behind the scenes so that we'll see all the points that I've covered so far come into effect, like all the best practices sometimes I've talked, how they come into effect, why, why I said so, will make more sense in this couple of slides to go. So durable uh, uh, functions actually use something called durable task framework. Durable task framework is nothing but a library written by uh, Microsoft for, um, for long running uh, workflows, basically to persist their state and without needing to worry about you implementing all that, uh, by yourself, you can simply use a wait async pattern to basically say, I want to get something done. You put it, put it, put it up as an await. Basically, it will take care of that state management. It will store the state and actually come back when it's done and continue from where it's left off. So for the state management, what will happen is as a part of Azure function, as you're deploying the Azure functions for durable function, one of the things you will be asked is actually Azure storage account. This is not an option. This, this must be provided for Azure functions to work with some, um, you know, uh, uh, basically some storage. In the storage, what will happen is as you actually create um, uh, the actual, or as you actually begin your Azure function, it will actually create relative history and instance table for that durable functions behind the scene. And also it will create some control queues and some work items queues basically to make sure uh, every time that you run an orchestrator, it will persist the history and their outcome and their inputs and out outputs, everything into that history table. And the queues will be used to basically sleep in and wake, up, wake it up again, basically to do all that. In between all that, 
it will be maintained in the state in that history table. Uh, very soon, we are going to look into the, I think in the, after this slide, we're going to look into the actual deep dive and go into the actual, um, the background of the uh, durable function and see how this is stored, uh, so to say, how, how all this information is stored. For me to show this, uh, I wish that I would show this slide very late in the, um, you know, as a part of my tool set. But uh, what I found out is using this tool at early on, I can actually showcase this very nicely so that everyone understand how durable functions maintain all this. This is an open source project uh, done by, I um, can't remember the developer's name now, um, but it's basically a durable functions monitor is an actually an extension to your VS code, as well as you can uh, deploy this to your own Azure environment if you wish to have it as an own instance basically to track your um, durable functions and their task history. Uh, I will showcase you the tables first, um, going into the demo first, and then I'll come into the tool and actually say, without actually needing to worry about all the tool jargon, uh, how we can actually see the background works. Jumping on to, okay. So in this one, um, this is my local storage, nothing fancy there. Basically I purge it out before I start the session. Um, as I've uh, explained, every time that we have a durable function running in the background, when we give a durable function, a basically a task hub name, it will create two tables. That two tables is maintaining all the statuses, all the functions that you basically run in the history. Um, their, their names will be there, their inputs and output will be stored as well. So like I said, this is why it's very important that you not to store anything that is very sensitive. Right, we, we care for our privacy data so much, but when it comes to durable function, we might be unwrapping a whole lot of other jargons all of a sudden because we are back and forth trans you know, transforming some sensitive data. This itself is a big, big security concern coming and challenging at the security, security teams saying that you, know, you should not be storing this sort of data in your orchestrators. And it's it becoming a very painful exercise thereafter sometimes to go and rework to make sure that you store so any, any of that data in your uh, storage accounts. What other things that they do is they actually create some queues you know, behind the scenes. So as you can see, there's some uh, control queues and some work items. They will be also creating some queues in order to help that. Now it's not very easy to actually navigate this sort of storage and actually see what really happened because it's so much of history, so much of things. What I did is I purposefully run my durable function a couple of minutes ago before I joined the session. Therefore, it's actually now very much has about 161 history items. It's not very readable. So let's look at something that very readable. Um, start using that now. So this particular extension is actually called durable task monitor. So if I actually durable functions monitor. So this particular function actually help you to sort of like, you know, uh, get this extension to you. You can configure your storage account that you use for your functions background. It's actually help you to see your uh, workflows as they happen. And it has some cool features, which I even identified today. They have done some gun charts and even uh, timelines as well. Um, so going on to the actual tool itself. Uh, so in this particular example, uh, we have a bunch of durable functions run through in the history. All of them seems to be very happily run. So I'll pick the hello one, for example. Uh, actually, let me do something which I want to do a uh, very long time. So just to showcase that this tool is actually live rather than I'm not showing just a static some data. Um, I'm going to actually purge, which is one of the features that it's available out of this tool. Basically, I can purge this history so I can have a fresh start basically uh, without having any history at all so that I can actually show you a clean state of records. So there's no history. The basically that two tables that we saw is all should be cleared out now. Okay. Coming on to my demo example, if I actually run this, it's actually running. Good. Let me begin this function. I think I have a one quick hello world. Um, there will be never be a demo without a hello world. So I thought I'll do a quick hello world um, with some other examples that I use in the demo as well. So let's hope that it'll run. Cool. Okay, cool. So we have this one hello uh, HTTP start. I'm just using it for one durable function. So let me actually go th there and actually show what it's all about. So it's written everything in one go. This is the pretty much the standard uh, template that we get from Microsoft for the durable functions. When you say we want a durable function, it's basically the starter function, the orchestrator function, and the activity function. The three functions that we minimum required to run this. 
what I can show you is the starter function. Basically, it's a HTTP trigger. If I trigger this now, it will kick off the actual Hello World uh, Orchestrator. And the Hello World Orchestrator will run three times the same activity with some names on. And basically, that will output the Hello with the name on pretty much. If I use this right, cool, that has run. And if I go into my tool to see the history, that is actually the, the actual Hello World Orchestrator function that ran. The good thing about that is every time that we run that orchestrator from the starter function, I told you that we will be getting an instance ID. The same instance ID that we can use to query the status of this particular workflow, what it's all about and all that information as well. In this tool, it's actually make our lives so much easy that we can, by clicking alone, we can actually go into the instance and actually see individual activities as well and how and what they were actually inputted and what all the information that they've output as well. So technically at the end of this particular function, we have been calling, uh, you know, uh, hello William and all that uh, information that we passed on and re retrieved back from our activities are actually recorded. Again, I'm emphasizing the fact that just imagine if we were using back and forth sensitive information, this information will be stored here please, please remove that um, or please consider your design again if you're using sensitive information in your orchestrators. Coming back to the actual example. Um, so back on the um, slide deck, to enrich the actual durable functions altogether, the experience of durable functions, we, we can do a few things as well. So one of the things that we can do is actually to enrich our login experience. Oops, that animation didn't work properly. That's fine. Um, fine. So when you're actually having a durable function with some logging enable, what will happen is if your durable function is not written in a fashion that to consider the replaying event, what will happen is logger will actually emit that event every time that you actually go past that line. So before .NET, uh, sorry, the durable, the, the sorry, Azure function 2.0, before that, I think it's actually all about, um, you need to explicitly call it out and say, if the context is not replaying, then emit this log. It's always very annoying that you have to write two lines, but the nicest thing that uh, they have done with the uh, two on words, it's actually, uh, they've actually given a way where you can actually instantiate your own logger, wrap it around this uh, extension method. What will happen is it will create you a safe uh, logger. Basically it's a replay safe. So if you call in this automatic, uh, uh, sorry, if you're calling this log message, it will automatically take in care of this exact condition saying, if it's already replaying, then do not log this. So automatically nicely you omit anything that, you know, extra logging will be not happening. Uh, fun thing, someone forget to actually put this on. Someone ran the, all the function. Uh, again, I don't want to na name the company or the team. What happens is actually um, they will end up with lots of logs more than the storage of their actual application. Because yes, logging is very good. Um, logging is very something very helpful when it's come to troubleshooting and all that. Having too many is actually annoying because sometimes they get sampled. Sometimes you don't get that enough information from logging. Having too less also is a problem. So find the balance and actually you know use that replay safe and also make sure that your logging is replay safe to ensure that you're not going to incur unnecessary charges to log. Uh, because if it's a loop or something like that, you'll be end up with huge amount of login data and for sure they will be sampled as well because they're not any worth because the same information will be repeated. The next point is about context rich logging. So when you are logging it, um, just for the fact, uh, avoid thinking about the, the highlighted section is not there. When you actually log the information like that within the durable function, very likely what is going to happen is there will be so much of um, log messages they look similar, they happen on the same places. What will happen is they will easily get sampled out. This is one of the primary sort of like problems that we face is sometimes we can't find our own logs, even though our functions were logging them, they were not available in our logs because what happens is logging sampling kick in because it's the same message, same information has been repeated. If you just had, let's say, something like making supplier onboarding to in progress as a text, it will be just a static text. Therefore, what will happen is it will be always ended up with uh, just a static text without actually having any richness to it. And that log will be just a matter of just a piece of text. Very likely you're going to see sampled and they are not going to see the details as well. Again, the encouragement is maybe use the function name and also you can use something called instance ID. 
the same instance ID that you're actually using it for the tracking in that uh, tool, as well as, you know, in, in, even if you want to go into the background and actually test that out, that instance ID will be available for you. So if you have some logging, if that instance ID that you can easily quickly track that particular orchestration instance and actually get the history exactly how it happens. So sometimes with that extra information, your login becomes much, much more uh, nicer and you'll be having much, much more uh, sort of like, you know, very, very smooth uh, supporting system if you, if you encourage that. Finally, using about custom statuses, I think I've covered in one of the status, the orchestrators can call something called custom statuses. It is basically to support um, uh, or keep a track of your um, Azure functions and say, I'm in this stage of the Azure function. So to say that, you know, if you want to sort of like you know, get a quick grasp of where that function or what is the last status of that function, you can sort of like do that. Also, if you were actually kicking off other orchestrators in this particular example, I'm using that sort of like uh, the, our payroll example, because the payroll orchestrator was kicked off by uh, onboarding uh, orchestrator instead of actually, you know, because it may not have access to the, the all that it has, it has this extra information that we are putting on saying uh, payroll, um, you know, instance ID is this. So if you want to track what payroll orchestration went or how the payroll orchestration uh, executed, you can use that instance ID as information. This custom status is a free thing. It's up to you what you save it. It's pretty much an open book. I think there's a limit on 16K. I think you can, you cannot store more than that, but I think you can use it for very, very good reasons and also show some progress. If you have some dashboard or if you have some um, tools to actually showcase where your individual workflows at, that can be used as well. Finally, uh, thinking about concurrency, uh, again, it's not mandatory. You don't need to think about uh, unless you have a specific reason, but it's something that we encourage. Um, find out a locking mechanism. Like if you have your orchestrators running for a long time, very likely you will have your orchestrators may stumble upon the same process again and again, maybe maybe by accident, maybe by, uh, you know, intentionally, but make sure that your orchestrators running the same instance or running the same job twice is omitted. Uh, how that lock mechanism is to be implemented, it's up to you. It's whether to use a, a, a sort of a storage mechanism or something like that. But again, from our experience, what we use is we actually use the blob lease mechanism. We actually had a small service written into a blob lease. So every time that I said um, we are running a particular Azure function, we'll be using that request ID or whatever the uniqueness to that I, um, function. We'll actually create a blob lease and actually acquire that lease and actually make sure that lease will be renewed every time that we will be running for a long operation and release at the end when it's done. So in that way, if another orchestrator all of a sudden trying to run the same request second time, you will be prevented because the lock cannot be acquired because lock is leased for something else. Again, not mandatory. It's just a good practice. If you think that you, you need some uh, you know, protection for your concurrency, that's something that you can use as well. Finally, very important one, timeouts. If you have long running ones, long running operations, consider timing out at some point. Every function must die at some point. If you have functions that is waiting indefinitely, that is very bad for a number of reasons. You may have functions that is maybe out of date. They might be updated and they might be actually um, gone into newer versions, but you're running an old version for far too long. What is that exact uh, ideal timeout is up to you to decide with the business and to basically to uh, you know, identify what is the ideal timeout for your individual functions, but make sure that you do timeout if you are waiting for something or at least escalate. If you're waiting for approval, let's say that somebody didn't approve it within that time, make sure that you branch out to another flow at some point without actually waiting indefinitely. That's very important uh, for you to sort of like, you know, uh, go that as well. Finally, um, uh, actually I covered the timeouts, that's fine. So that comes to sort of like the end uh, of what we want to do with the durable function. So some list of to-dos, uh, again, uh, I'm not going to repeat all of it, but again, uh, things like, you know, making sure that we write our uh, uh, durable function in a deterministic fashion, consider about uh, ID important, basically make sure that we can rerun them. Uh, again, think about, um, you know, single responsible, and again, uh, finally, think about, you know, leveraging monitoring and uh, alerting tools. Uh, finally, to think about, you know, if you want durable function to be, you know, written in a fashion that can be supported, that can be well um, maintained in that fashion. 
one of the primary uh, learnings that we had is there was a business requirement. I think the developers didn't completely understood the, the actual requirement could have been achieved in a different way. They have implemented the, the, the alerting of a fail function via an email. So every function that fell, they will be sending an email, which is a very bad, bad, bad thing. I'll be discouraging that because you don't imagine if you actually have Azure function that actually gone into an error and you'll be spamming with emails very easily. This can be achieved by alerting and our metrics of monitoring. They can be easily create alerts when, when the same function is failing for far two times and you can actually have alerts to trigger certain support events. Not just the email is the right thing to do. Finally, uh, it's not a big thing, but again, um, dependence injection is supported. Please use dependence injection. You can then actually make it, make you more unit testable, um, you know, code. Few don'ts, which I think I've covered many of it, uh, uh, like passing sensitive, sensitive information. I said, no, no for that. Uh, one of the bigger other thing is do not over-engineer for future scenarios. Uh, very common mistake, trying to do the durable functions putting up all the future requirements together and trying to decide, okay, let's create an orchestrator function for this. And sometimes we never use it at the end. Use, go, go with the function if you have to. Um, again, I did a session on durable function. I'm not saying, you know, not to use durable function, but if you have to start with Azure functions, start with Azure functions. Then if it's required, go and actually engineer your Azure function to make it a durable function. Like I showed you all, already in the slides that we passed on, it's, it's merely another function. You don't need to over-engineer to say, I need to use durable function for this because that's the right thing to do. You never know. So think about very carefully when it's required, think about actually implementing it with its activity or another orchestrator. Again, it's a decision that you got to make, but do not over-engineer. That's very important. Finally, um, input and outputs, what you pass into your uh, Azure functions or the, the activities, make sure that they have enough information only. Do not pass back and forth the entire payloads of data. That's a very bad practice in terms of, um, you know, trying to maintain the state. And also um, think about think about the privacy as well. Like it's going back to the sensitive matter. Finally, uh, email notification. I think I already covered that email notification is not the right thing to do. Uh, please don't use emails. Uh, the first thing that we've been asking is uh, after releasing one of the function is please disable that requirement. After working maybe a couple of days, that's another waste of time. So. If a business user asks that we need to know when the particular workflow finishes, there are built-in Azure monitoring and alerting capabilities we can achieve this. As far as you do the right login, as far as you do the right things, you don't need to worry about it. So very simply, uh, we covered uh, what durable functions are. Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, they have a starter and basically uh, they coordinate all the events and basically, you know, uh, they either call activities or sub-orchestrators, they run in sequence or in parallel up to you, basically your, your business rules. Uh, goes to sleep when on awaits and come back when the, when the, when the work is complete and replay history when, when, until its last checkpoint. And then it's going to continue until it's done. It's merely it's just a, a framework that has been actually taken care of you, all of those work. All you got to think about writing your business logic as you would write any other Azure function. Finally, uh, so we covered all the uh, uh, understanding, all the durable functions, some behind the scenes, some do's and don'ts, and some troubleshooting hints, basically using that sort of a tool. Um, my last part of slide is basically have some links to you to go back and maybe refer. I'll probably have this slide shared to you um, maybe via the, the meetup channel. And I'm off for any, I'm not sure whether with the time, I actually have a stopwatch with that. I think I'm over, overrun, but I'm open for any questions.